Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig LP, The Moynian Group. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Muss Development LLC, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers. Welcome to Building New York. My name is Michael Stoller. Some people start companies for, with names that relate to something. Some other people just come out with Building New York. But today I have someone whose parents, his father, lived on Essex Street, uh, on Houston Street, and he created Essex Capital. I'm happy today, who better be comfortably, looks too stiff, to have Mitch Rutter. Uh, principal of Essex Capital today as my guest. Thank you for having me, Michael. Mitch, you know, you said, when we met, you said to me, you were an overachiever. Uh, you were born in the Bronx, and um, you subsequently moved to Bayside. But I think the, the real interesting story really relates to your granddad. Uh, you, your grandpa uh, was from uh, Austria. He was from Austria, that's right. And he came over, and then he went back to Austria, fought in the war, came back here, right? That's correct. And when he comes back here, he gets a job as a waiter, and he lives where, on Houston Street? On the Lower East Side on, uh, on Houston Street, that's correct. And uh, he had two sons? He had two, uh, two sons, one my father, the older uh, brother, and then my uncle, uh, three and a half years younger. Yeah, but I think it's, it's interesting if you tell me a little bit about your dad, because I think, as you said to me the other day, your dad was your mentor. Your dad was the guy who really mold, molded your life. Well, I, I have to give my mother credit in there no, as well. No, I but, understand. But, but, yeah. uh, but I will tell you, my father um, uh, was born on the Lower East Side, and um, his first language was uh, Yiddish. Uh, you know, when he started school, he uh, couldn't ask to leave the room in, in English. And, uh, you know, he went to city schools. He went uh, after high school. Uh, he really didn't have the opportunity to uh, uh, go to college, uh, although he would have liked to. And he uh, became uh, entrepreneurial. He, that was his bent. A sign painter. He was a sign painter. He was a furrier. And at some point... Window trimmer? He was a win that's right, thank you. Uh, and then at some point, he uh, got into the business of uh, window cleaning. Uh, he would buy a route. Uh, he would increase the uh, number of shops on the route. And, and he'd actually wash and the windows. That's correct. My father um, used to have to put alcohol in the, in the water in the wintertime so that uh, the water wouldn't freeze on the windows. But the, uh, I guess the, the key uh, ingredient uh, and characteristic of my dad really was uh, hard work, consistency, and, um, and, and a drive. And notwithstanding all of that, he somehow managed to do it in a, in a way where he always had time for the family. And I think that's what impressed me the most and helped me uh, formulate uh, as part of my goal being in my own business because I wanted to have uh, the flexibility that uh, he showed with us. You know. We didn't have uh, really the most uh, wealth. In fact, we really weren't wealthy at all. But um, but he was always around. You know, he was the one dad who showed up in uh, in school on open school day, uh, and this is without a BlackBerry and without a cell phone. Uh, and he was totally focused on uh, on uh, me or or my sister. So now you're born in the Bronx. 
you move to Bayside, you go to Cardoza, uh, you go to PS2 213, because That's I right. went to PS216, and uh, for us older people, there was something called the SP, and there was, as I said to my wife the other day, I was telling her about you, uh, she said she made the three-year SP, you made the two-year SP. Right. I, I think we could have opted for either, and some, some but, of but us you chose... But you had a desire. And I did. You had a desire, and you, you finish uh, PS213 in, in Queens. You go then to Cardoza High School. Well, there was a, there was an intermediate school in the middle, which we then the two-year SP, we skipped seventh grade. Right, and, and then Cardoza. And then at 14 and a half years of age, or 15, you decide not to go to the 12th grade? After 11th grade, what do you do? What happened? You know, I... I um it was, a, it was a couple of factors, I think, triangulating, and in hindsight, it sounds like I had such a specific vision, but I at least had enough sense of myself to, to think at least in a general sense then. Uh, first, I, I was very, very interested in, in, uh, in history and politics, and uh, I thought I could pursue it and wanted to pursue that uh, as soon as I could by, by pursuing in college. I wasn't getting enough out of, out of it in high school. Second, uh, I knew, I wasn't sure exactly what the path was, but I knew that I wanted to go to law school, and I knew that the law wouldn't be my last stop. And I really wanted to get my education behind me so I could get started on whatever path I was going to take. So you didn't graduate high school. I left after 11th grade. And then at, you, were, you were like... It was 15 and a half. I mean, the semester starts. You go to NYU. NYU accepts you. That's right. And, and even at NYU, you, you're, you're interesting. You still have a desire because you graduate in three and a half years. Well, it, at, at NYU, at NYU, um, I graduated in three and a half years. I had already been accepted. My dream was to go to NYU Law School, which I which I did. It was. Uh, really a stellar institution and, and has only since improved more, but it, it really was great. And so I had been admitted there uh, early, and I knew that I was going to have to work very, very hard in law school. So quite frankly, the last six months, uh, I got out of college in January, and it, I, I just took a break. And uh, I worked as a paralegal for the uh, uh, New York City, for the Corporation Counsel's Office in the Litigation Division. And I um, worked and uh, spent time with friends knowing uh, that I would the, need the to immerse myself. But now the interesting thing, you know, some kids, you, we were talking, you know, you, you know, you were saying to me when we met, you know, there, there's the echo boomer, there's the baby boomer, and, you know, one of the greatest things about growing up in New York, sometimes you, you had that opportunity to go up to the Catskills. And when you were in high school and even, you, you know, even in college, uh, you, um, you worked at the Tamarack? Tamarack Lodge. I spent my uh, summers... Uh, working uh, on the staff of Tamarack Lodge, I was the uh, uh, stage manager and, and uh, used to deal with the sound and lighting for the shows. Not good, just like here. So, so now it, you're 19 uh, years of age and you, you start NYU Law. And um, your first summer, uh, because at law school, um, in between you work for the American Stock Exchange? Right. My first year, the summer between my first and second years, I worked in the compliance group at the at the Amex. That's correct. Right. Now, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, your dad was not in the real estate business. He was in the route business with the, okay, which subsequently well, he the, ultimately parlayed that into it, into it, uh, building it, it, up it, a, it, a maintenance a business, maintenance a company. Business. But I mean, you wanted to be a lawyer. You wanted to be an entrepreneur. Because what I'm trying to say is, really, you weren't into real estate. Later that, on, you do. That's but, correct. But you, the real estate was. You wanted to be an entrepreneur, but the question of being in real estate wasn't there. That's correct. So, but I think what really happens, and you you graduate law school, uh, you, you your first job is a short job, but it was a great job of learning. You you go to work for the the old Schulte Roth. Right. That uh, at that time was Schulte and McGoldrick. Schulte, right? and over there you're there about six months, and then this guy who's about 23 years of age gets a job with what we would call a white shoe law firm, a very prominent Sullivan and Cromwell. No, Simpson Thatcher. Simpson Thatcher, I apologize. Simpson, so how, what, are you, what are you doing at Simpson Thatcher? At Simpson Thatcher, I, um, there was a, a relatively new department that was formed. Simpson Thatcher and the, the bulk of the downtown firms, their real estate practices were, were traditionally 
uh, rooted in banking. And uh, Simpson Thatcher, to their credit, wanted to grow a practice on the uh, equity, on the development side. And they had brought in a uh, partner laterally uh, who became a good friend and a mentor of mine, uh, Sandy Grossman. And uh, I joined that department uh, representing um, uh, investment banks in, in, in doing interesting structured finance deals, uh, representing um, Salomon Brothers was a client. Uh, we had done work for the Cohn Brothers, but also representing Bellamy Development Corporation, in, uh, which at that time was one of the biggest uh, office building builders and owners in Jersey, uh, doing their leasing. And I really got a full exposure to, um, as close as I could get as a lawyer, to really the uh, full gamut of, of real estate transactions, and I got to do some banking uh, as well. So now you spent about five years, I believe, at... Uh, That's right. Uh, and then uh, in the same path of your running, as opposed to some people wanting to prolong the time, you wanted to get into it. At 27, you said, I, I, I really want to get into the real estate business, and you get involved with another legendary individual, um, uh, Julian Studley. And what do you do with Julian Studley? You know, Julian had uh, really created the concept of uh, tenant representation, not just taking building agencies, but representing tenants. And he was a, a storied leasing broker. Uh, but I had read an article that he was uh, beginning to dabble in acquiring transactions. Um, I think the article I had read uh, talked about how he had uh, won a city competition to rebuild the old heliport in the East 60s. And so, uh, again, through uh, my old partner at Simpson Thatcher, Sandy, I was introduced to Julian. And together, we formed a, a, uh, a venture that essentially uh, went out and, and bought deals. And the concept was to um, utilize Julian's national network of offices to find opportunity and um, reap the benefits. Now, one of the first deals was, what, 888 Lexington Avenue? 888 Lexington Avenue was a, uh, that's correct, it was a building that I bought from McDonald's. McDonald's had built it, uh, but due to community opposition, uh, was, ultimately didn't open it. And uh, we bought this building, which had a, uh, a tenant in it, the Forgotten Woman, that's correct. But I, I love this story. And what was the entity that you and Julian created, that the Forgotten Woman, which was a, a large-size woman's store? Plus-size woman's store. A plus-size woman that paid rent to. Uh, they had to pay rent to uh, our entity, which was uh, Zoftig Associates. Zoftig Associates. Interesting. Uh, then you didn't... You have to have fun as right. well. Right. But then you did an interesting thing. Uh, you did an assemblage. Okay? That's correct. You know, not, not lower Manhattan, but you did an assemblage on uh, 22nd, 23rd Street. And 3rd Avenue. And 3rd Avenue, uh, which, which you basically then sold to... We sold that to... Uh, to uh, a branch of the Algonians, that's correct. And, and, and on it is uh, now the Electra uh, uh, rental uh, building, a high rise. Right. Then you did Fairfax, Virginia? Right. Um, um, we, did a, we did a good run of deals, Julian and I. We, uh, I had also uh, acquired land in Fairfax County uh, and uh, designed and zoned two towers, large towers, about uh, 400,000 feet apiece, which for that market is significant. And um, again, uh, much to my frustration, you know, we, Julian was not a builder, right. um, and we sell, we wound up selling it to a, uh, a GE venture. Right. But you know, I, I think the interesting. We want to really focus more on the tri-state area. Was uh, was the property on the corner of Forty Second Street the, the the first time that you had that property? Right. Uh, what was that? When I uh, when Julian and I uh, got together, he owned fifty percent of an old uh, mansion that had actually been uh, the home of a former U.S. Vice President, uh, Levi Morton. And uh, he owned 50 percent, and his partner was trying to uh, force a sale of the full property. And uh, I wound up orchestrating a transaction where uh, I came in uh, with, with uh, a group and bought out the partner. So now we owned the full property, Julian and I. Uh, we ran it. We were generating a lot of rents from just the ground floor, uh, but it looked bad. It was... Uh, this was on the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. That's correct. It was on the northeast corner. It was a single building. Uh, we were generating rents. We were operating it. Of course, 42nd and 5th then uh, was not as uh, clean and uh, desirable as it is now, but clearly it was one of the busiest corners in the city. Uh, 
Uh, and ultimately, uh, during the peak of the market for the Japanese buyers, uh, we were offered a tremendous amount of uh, uh, money to sell it, and, and we did that. Uh, and then ultimately, the buyer uh, and I struck up a relationship, uh, and it was the only time really uh, at that point that I had ever done a consulting job, and I assembled for that buyer all of the property around that corner, and we wound up assembling uh, 507 fifth, 505 fifth. Of course, they had already owned 503 fifth, and as well, we also got into that package 1 East 42nd Street. Uh, and then when the market turned for the Japanese, the, the assemblage broke apart. Uh, and, um, but later on in the program, we'll talk what happens on that. Now, it's 1991 or 1992, I think. It was 92. 92, and you said, I've had a good run with Julian. Julian was doing something up, and, and you really wanted to, uh, as you had before, you told me you always wanted to be on your own, completely on your own. Then you create Essex Capital. I created Essex Capital. But it was a tough time. This was the RTC days. It was a, you know, sometimes people will say the worst of the times are the best of the times to go into a business. That, that's true, and, and it's sad that, it's, that, it's a tr that it can sound trite, but that's certainly true, particularly for someone who enters the business with some savings th that had been earned from prior deals, but it's in those bad times that not only uh, can you find opportunity, but it's the great equalizer because the deals that can get done are, are, can be done by those people who can be creative. Right, and, and one of the first, and you know, the RTC had a number of them. The first one was in Connecticut, right? Right, it was a deal that I bought in East Haven, Connecticut, uh, which even in good times is sem somewhat depressed. Uh, and we bought um, a failed condominium uh, townhouse development probably 80 units, 82 units, in different states of completion. Some were finished, some didn't have kitchens, some were just foundations, some just had roughings. And we basically had to finish these uh, and sell them. And um, I would say that to sell the 82 units, I probably had to sell them 100 times. Because during the contract period, our buyers, unfortunately, kept losing their jobs and couldn't close. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I remember the, the, there was a shopping center, but after the shopping center, another RTC, there was an interesting one. You took a, a failed uh, condominium also in White Plains. That's correct. And, and I think, tell me about that, because there's the Anthony, Anthony Mason story on that one also, the They've, former basketball player. Also from a, from a bank, we bought a, uh, a sponsor position in uh, two high-rise condos in White Plains called Westage Towers. And um, we had to finish some units there, but obviously they were completed. And we just had to be aggressive. There was clearly a market, but it wasn't that deep. And uh, we sold two units to athletes, one to Adam Graves of the Rangers and then one to Anthony Mason. And I was desperate to sell the unit. It was a large unit. There weren't many buyers who could afford the large units. And in walking through the unit I wanted to sell uh, with his agent, the uh, interesting or the uh, key factor was the, the size of the header into the master bathroom from the master bedroom. The agent was afraid that when he got up during the night, he would hit his head, and he wanted me to knock the header out, and it was not possible structurally. So uh, the way I overcame that was by putting on a light with a motion detector, so that if he got up during the night, the light would go on and he would be jarred awake. Right, then you bought a shopping center right near Roosevelt Field? Right, on Stewart, uh, Stewart Avenue. We bought that also. Uh, our early acquisitions were from banks, uh, and it gave us our momentum, uh, Stewart Plaza. It was a Caldor anchored center. And after that, you bought another shopping center, we, uh, Walbaum Shopping Center in Lake Ronkonkoma. Lake Ronkonkoma, that came with a, um, a piece of property with it that we were able to develop with a partner, a, uh, an additional uh, 180,000 feet. Right. And now you, you, you know, you, you, now you really come back to New York. It's a difficult time, it's about 1997, and you and a partner Buy, uh, two partners, you buy 1500 Broadway. Right, I would say Be it was before 96. 42nd, right. Before Times Square and before 42nd Street right. was ready. Right, it was, it was 1996. And um, I would say that that deal was probably one of the two or three biggest done that year. It was a um, $55, $57 million purchase of 1500 Broadway, uh, which we bought from Crossland Savings Bank. And um, Times Square was uh, nowhere near where it has evolved to today. Uh, but the but you know recognizing value recognizing value is key in 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 
any locale for real estate. And uh, this building was just perfectly positioned, perfectly positioned. Now, after that, you really, you did a very interesting thing, which you still own today, the, uh, the property in Virginia. In Maryland. Maryland. In Maryland. Right. You know, I had grown familiar with the D.C. submarkets uh, through my time uh, and doing deals with Julian. And I had always thought that it would be good to pursue two tracks. Of course, my first love is New York. Uh, but in order to keep the momentum going and, and be a hedge against uh, other turns in New York, I wanted to have uh, uh, other areas of focus. And so we had bought in Rockville, Maryland, which is a suburb 20 minutes outside of D.C. by Metro, the eight and a half acres that um, surround the, the Metro stop. It, it was home to a failed mall, one of these old 70s uh, uh, redevelopment jobs, and it just made no sense. And I wound up buying that, or th this mall, the company that owned the mall, uh, and we put together a, a really, uh, and it's one of the things that I love about real estate, it, it, the vision was to uh, rebuild the entire downtown, to facilitate the regrowth. And the worst part of that job was the job. It choked off the grid pattern of the city. So we uh, brought in uh, key architects, uh, you know, HOK, and we put a plan together to put the grids back of the streets downtown. We demolished them all. Uh, we convinced the city, state, and the county to each contribute $6 million. We put in $6 million, and we developed uh, parcels. In other words, I built the sewers, the roads, the uh, parks. We held a competition for a, uh, a statue on the courthouse steps that's in downtown Rockville. And we are zoned, we were zoned for about a 1.6 million feet. Uh, our first phase was a uh, movie theater shopping pavilion in order to get traffic there seven days a week. Um, our second phase in demolishing the mall, I let stand, I did not demolish an old department store. And I turned that into a 200,000 foot office building, which also has, by the way, a 436 car garage. Uh, and that, you know, we own today, and it's, it's been very successful. Right. So then, then you come back to New York, and, and you go in and you buy a very interesting. The Second Avenue has had a number of office buildings, but really limited office buildings. Uh, and you and a partner buy Two Dog Hamish or Plaza. Two Dog Hamish or Plaza. It was a building that was probably 94. 95% vacant at the time. Uh, it had come up for sale by a Jamaican insurance company, and um, it was right off Dog Hamishol Park, one block from the UN. And yeah. I'm sorry. Well, our vision was to convert this building into office condos so that missions to the UN could purchase them and thereby not pay uh, the New York City real estate taxes. And um, we were able to buy that building through uh, very good uh, structured finance from uh, Andy Stone at, at First mm -hmm. Boston. And uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a home run transaction, but it was... Uh, it was an interesting one. What an interesting one. And you said, you, basically, subsequently, you sold all the condominium units to all UN entities or... That's correct. All, all missions all to missions. the UN. Then you go downtown. You go down to William Street. The Williams insurance. and Fulton, the old insurance exchange, and 151 you, Williams Street. And what do you do over there? Uh, we bought a, um, about a 200,000 foot building right on the corner of Fulton and William. Uh, the building was uh, leased in large part to a good credit tenant, uh, Thompson Financial. Uh, we leased up the vacant space. We created more retail space. Um, and uh, we were able to generate a large amount of cash flow and uh, do, do some very, very good financing on that project. There were air rights for, f for the future. Uh, you know, the interesting thing on that, on that building, uh, you know, to talk about background. Right, it was a land lease, you told well, it me. It was a land lease, but it was owned by the Dutch Reformed Church, which owned, owned the ground before the United States was the United States. And I just remember meeting with the church and looking at, at all of their documents and their papers and wondering where my ancestors were at, at, at that time in history. They, they were in, in uh, Manhattan Island, They were certainly, uh, I'm sure, on some shtetl in Poland. I, I want to move uh, qu uh, quick because we have a limited amount of time. Then you bought some unsold units at 200... Uh, 200 90th. East 90th Street. We, right. we bought a bunch of units but in then retail. I, and then you go to the west side and you buy a, a former East East River or East New York? It's uh, the old um, East River Savings Bank East River Savings on 96th Bank. and Amsterdam. And 96th and Amsterdam. And what do you do over there? Because that was a, a landmark. 
Well, it wasn't, it wasn't a landmark uh, when I went to contract. Uh, it became a landmark during my contract period when the bank that was operating in there announced that they were relocating. You know, the West Side uh, community is a very vocal, aggressive community, and they petitioned uh, Mayor Giuliani to calendar the building for landmarking. Um, I decided not to oppose the landmarking on the exterior as long as the interior was left alone. And uh, we wound up switching gears. It was my uh, plan, and we had already full sets of plans, to build a rental job. I like residential rental in Manhattan. We were going to build a rental tower there. Uh, I wound up instead creating inside the building, which had a 70-foot first floor, a second floor midway. Uh, and we've rented the building to a CVS on the bottom, a successful private school in the middle, and we have a city agency at the top. Then you go, to, then you go towards uh, the Lincoln Tunnel and you buy the Remco building. Right, on the block front between 38th and 39th Street and 10th Avenue. Um, it was before uh, the neighborhood really caught on. Uh, now, of course, you have Rock Rose building two towers for residential there. Um, and we managed to vacate that building. And lease it up to DHL. We leased the building to DHL, and, um, w w which includes a, a, uh, a guarantee from their parent, which is Deutsche Post, so it became a credit deal. Then you go to 47th Street on the west side, right? 636 uh, 11th, that's, 11th. Uh, that's correct. The, the old Global Crossing headquarters, uh, which uh, after Global Crossing failed, you wound up with a 600,000-foot uh, vacant building uh, with um, the most sophisticated air conditioning system that you can imagine. And then after that, now you come back to New York. You did a lot of building in, uh, in Maryland. Now you build in New York. And a couple of months ago, or it's recently, you built in Brooklyn some rentals on Skimmerhorn Street. That's correct. We just topped out um, on Skimmerhorn Street, uh, or just off of court, uh, a, uh, a rental building. Uh, we're using 421A, uh, you know, the, te the program. It'll be uh, market rate units, but then the uh, rent increases will be set. And then you're also now building in uh, Williamsburg on Berry Street, you we're said. Building, we're building um, a job, really two, two buildings on um, uh, Berry Street North 10th, as well as a, uh, a, another condominium in, in Park Slope. And uh, how, why, why, why'd you change to be in the rental business, you know, in the apartment business now? You know, our, our goal, my goal, is to create uh, core assets that uh, generate uh, really annuities, that just generate consistent income. I mean, it's always good, like everyone, to uh, create a condominium and sell it and make a quick profit. But I'm looking to create generational assets. And so, um, uh, in, ad in addition, uh, remember, I'm, I'm, I'm a New York product. Uh, I'm a product of the boroughs. You, there, there is no question you're a New York product, you're an achiever, and you've done a lot, and you've been, and you've become a builder of New York, and I'm happy you've been with me today. Major funding for this program is made possible by grants from HSH Nordbank New York Branch and First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Perfect Building Maintenance, Greenberg Traurig LP, The Moynian Group. Additional funding for this program is made possible by grants from Ann Terry's Real Estate, Arbor Realty Trust, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Fremont Investment and Loan, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Muss Development LLC, Rosenthal and Rosenthal Inc., Signature Bank, Stonehenge Partners, Swig Equities, The Engel Berman Group, The Wickoff Group, Titan Capital, YL Real Estate Developers. <laughs>